Bonjour, film fans. There's murder in the village. Unfortunately for you, your newfound friend might just be the killer. Join me as we continue our spring foray into French cinema with the 1970 film Le Boucher on this episode of What Makes This Film Great. <laughs> Hey film fans, I don't review a lot of television on this channel, but I thought it might be fun to look at the new series from Paramount, The Offer, about the making of The Godfather. I'll be doing that over on Patreon, and over the next couple months, I'll have capsule reviews of every episode. So if you want to see a little bit of my thoughts about this new series, about The Godfather in general, head on over to Patreon and throw me a couple of ducats. Thanks. Before we get started, I'd just like to thank my viewer Al Hussein Amar, who has suggested a couple of times that I do a video on Chabrol, and it was that suggestion that got me thinking maybe I'd do a series on French cinema, and voila, here we are. So thank you Al Hussein. This sort of series is a result of your suggestions, and to the rest of my viewers, if you've got things you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. Now let's get to the film. Le Boucher is a 1970 film that was written and directed by Claude Chabrol. It features the cinematography of Jean Rabier and it's edited by Jacques Gaillard, both of whom worked extensively with Chabrol, especially in this period from the late 60s through the early to mid 70s. Another constant collaborator of Chabrol was the composer Pierre Jensen, who does the fabulous music for this as well. I bring this up because Chabrol is considered one of the kind of core members of the French New Wave. He was a writer at Cahiers du Cinéma, like Truffaut, like Godard, and so many others, who then got into filmmaking and who developed a signature style, a signature thematic approach. And, I mean, he's one of the giants of the second half of the 20th century French cinema. But also, he developed probably more than the others, a troupe, <laughs> a, a collaborative crew around him, behind the camera, including those I've mentioned, Rabier, Gaillard, and so on, and in front of the camera, particularly in the person of Stéphane Audreau, who was his wife for many years and who starred in many of his films. So yes, we can call him a French auteur, but he was a highly collaborative auteur who developed intimate working relationships with these cast and crew that, um, I don't know, we could say shared his vision or at the, at the least whom he saw as best being able to realize his vision. Chabrol and his filmography are often described as Hitchcockian or as the sort of French Hitchcock. We know that the French New Wave filmmakers and critics were highly influenced by and amorous of Hitchcock and his filmography. In a way, we can say that it was these French filmmakers who elevated Hitchcock from a sort of jobbing genre director to the auteur he's considered today, um, particularly through a series of interviews that Truffaut did with him, but through their writings in Cahiers du Cinema as well, and their general sort of reverence for and promotion of his, his body of work. It can be hard to remember, I don't remember, I wasn't alive, but it can be hard to consider that there was a time in the 40s and 50s and even in through the 60s when this change was going on, when Hitchcock was kind of considered by the sort of film literati as a, as a schlock master, as a, a ghettoized genre practitioner and not the sort of master of human psychology that he's often considered today. And Chabrol, probably more than any of the others, um, wears that influence. And, and I think it's not fair to say he's only influenced by Hitchcock though, but that he takes this sort of Hitchcockian um, psychological horror, psychological thriller, um, but a thriller of manners, a thriller of personality 
and probes it and pushes it and develops it in different ways. So it's not kind of redundant of Hitchcock. It's not um, purely imitative. Chevrolet's work is its own thing that may be inspired by Hitchcock, but develops into something, for me anyways, that is perhaps more engaging. There's a, there's a, and I'm not an expert on Chabrol, but there's a kind of warmth. He's often described as cynical, I'm not gonna lie, but I find in his treatment of his characters, there's less of a remove where Hitchcock has that kind of distanciation between himself, his camera, and his characters. With Chabrol, there's more of an intimacy. And I don't know if that's a personal thing or French thing. Um, uh, an artistic thing where he's pushing to create his own um, body of work that's different from if inspired by Hitchcock. But you definitely feel it in Le Boucher. So let's talk a little bit about how that film works, what it does, and why it's so effective at its psychological thriller. As I said, it's a 1970 film, and it's almost, one could say, a two-hander. Um, it again stars Stéphane Audran as Alain, or Helene, who is the headmistress, the head teacher at a small school in a French village. Jean Yannet plays um, Popal. Paul is his name, but he's called Popal throughout the film. And Popal is originally from the village, and he's gone away to war, and he's been away for over a decade. And now he's returned and he is a butcher and he has inherited his father's butcher shop and the title of the film Le Boucher is The Butcher. Um, and both of these two feel like strangers in the village. Elaine, Helene is not from there. She's been here just for a few years. So she knows people and she's welcomed and she's a warm character and she's not sort of outcast or anything, but she is a single woman in 1970 in a small town who kind of keeps to herself. She's pleasant, she's enjoyable. She's not sort of dark and lonely. She loves the children, the children love her, but there's a sense around her that, um, she's alone, if not lonely. Popal, on the other hand, is from here, but he's been away for a long time. And as the film makes abundantly clear, uh, his time at war, so he was at war in French Indochina, which became the Vietnam War eventually, and also in Algeria. And this has affected his outlook on life. And so as he's returned to the village, he also feels in a way like an outsider. Neither of them ever say this. And this is part of the, the power of the film is that a lot is unstated. A lot is stated too, <laughs> but a lot is unstated. Um, but it just part of the film's form and style is such that these two characters are almost the only two characters in the film. There are others. There's the other school teacher and his wife whose wedding opens the film. There's the um, police investigator who comes in from out of town, who's in a couple important scenes. And there are the children, one or two in particular. But mainly this is about Elaine and Popal and their burgeoning friendship against the backdrop of some brutal murders of young women that have started happening in and around the village. So their sense of being alone together is a very important driver of how the film works, particularly some of the decisions that Helene is going to make throughout the film as it becomes, let's just say possible for now, that Popal is the killer. The film makes incredibly effective use of themes and metaphor, and it blends them in a dance, ironically, that's one of the metaphors, <laughs> mm. uh, of, of intersecting meanings. 
and that's part of what gives the film its kind of psychological depth because this is not a film with a ton of interior exploration. We do get some from Popal as he talks about how the war has affected him. He talks a little bit about his relationship with his father. Um, in one very important scene, Elaine talks about her uh, a past relationship, romantic relationship. But much of the depth of the film comes from uh, uh, the world in which it exists, how the characters move through it, how they relate to each other, and, and the choices that they make. And the power of those choices uh, um, arises from the kind of metaphorical and thematic world that the film has created. So I'd just like to talk about those very briefly before I get into talking about Elaine as a character and her relationship with Popal. So one of the first themes is the nature of man. And in this case, we could use man in the old fashioned sense as it used to be used to mean all of humanity. And it's used that way in the film, in one scene in particular, um, but also the nature of the male. Um, and Popal talks a lot about war. Popal talks a lot about his relationship with his father. Um, he talks a lot about, well, significantly about um, romantic sexual relationships between men and women and expectations. And he has certain expectations um, around women, and I'll come back to those in a moment. Um, but there's also this kind of, what is the nature of man or humanity? Um, what do people do? How do people act and why? And this is announced subtly, strangely, during the opening credit sequence, which is set against a series of cave paintings. What? <laughs> but this will come back later in a very important scene. Elaine takes the children on an outing to a cave near the village in which these cave paintings exist. And there's a series of shots of the children traveling through the caves, looking at the cave paintings, and then emerging from the caves in a really nice long take while Elaine talks to them about Cro-Magnon Man. And her, her, her speech here is very interesting because she's talking about the nature of the Cro-Magnon and she's talking about, she says at one point something very important. We wouldn't exist if not for the Cro-Magnon. And to put it in kind of 1970 parlance, like there's a little bit of caveman in us. And it's done subtly. She doesn't say that, like we're part savage, but it's there in the story. And immediately after that talk, she and the children are going to stumble upon one of the murdered bodies in the sort of most brutal scene that we get in the film as we see first drops of blood drip from a cliff above onto one of the students' face. It's horrible. And then Elaine go up and examine this body. Um, so she's having this conversation about Cro-Magnons and sort of cavemen. And then we get this um, very visual rep representation of the ongoing potential of man's savagery. A second example of the film's kind of themes or thematic development is the nature of PTSD, particularly after war. Now, if you've been watching any of my other French Spring videos, you know that this actually has come up quite a bit. And we get a little bit of it in um, Lift to the Gallows. We get some of it in, in Clio, and we get some of it here. So, of course, these are only a few films from the era, but it seems that in French culture at the time, at least in French filmmaking culture, but it was also there elsewhere, there was an obsession with, or a, a preoccupation at least, with the effects of the sort of late colonial wars of France. And this film, Le Boucher, uh, dramatizes the potential for PTSD 
in dramatic fashion, much more heavily than the previous films we've looked at, because Popal is clearly damaged by his experiences in war. And that damage is going to become kind of the psychological foundation for some of his actions in the film. Um, linked to that, and also a part of the film's thematic milieu, is some pretty blatant misogyny. And some of it is violent. The victims of these murders are young women. I mean, that's as misogynist as you can get. And some of it is the kind of thing that we might look at 1970 and go, oh, you know, that's just the way that it was. But when you take, oh, that's just the way that it was, and compare it with the murder of these women, it's not so easy to excuse. And we get these weird little examples, like early in the film, Popal and Helene have just met, and they're walking through the village, and she decides to smoke, and we get this little moment. You know, that's an example, like, ooh, a woman smoking outdoors? How progressive of you, <laughs> right? We get another moment later in the film when Helene offers to give Popal a ride. Now, he's not necessarily making fun of women drivers there, but he is. He mocks her little car, and it's, it's playful ribbing, but at the same time, it, it's an expression of his condescension towards women. And one of the great things about Elaine's character throughout the film is she just kind of sloughs it off. She's a very secure and well-rounded woman. And her depiction in this film is, is one of its strengths because she's, just because she's secure, well-rounded, and, and a strong woman, she's not without her own flaws or her own damage, let's say, which becomes very important to the kind of the last act of the film or from the midpoint on, really. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, you get this metaphor of the dance. And this is literalized in the film. Um, we open on a wedding. There's a school teacher, Elaine's colleague, and his new bride. And we get dancing and discussions of dancing. Uh, later in the film, we're going to get a scene in the schoolyard when they're preparing for um, a festival event. And Elaine is taking the children through their dance moves and Popal shows up in costume, it's a little creepy, and they dance again. And this is a literalization of the metaphorical dance that's going on here, or dances even, one of which is Popal and Elaine's slow, slowly developing relationship. What is this going to be? The way the film presents it early on is that this is a, a burgeoning romantic relationship. But whenever it seems that that might be the next step, Elaine shuts it down. So there's this dance around how do they relate to each other? Are they in love? Are they going to have a sexual relationship? What is going on with them? There's also the dance as it begins to dawn on Helene that Popal might be the murderer of her decision making around where to take this, you know, what to do with this information. And all what makes these metaphors work is that they don't exist in isolation. They're all working together. So for example, Popal has been letting Elaine know that he would be interested in spending more time with her, and it seems fairly innocent, if a little pushy. He shows up at work, and she's teaching, and he knocks on the window, things like this. And so far she sees this as playful and fun, and so they're leaving the school one day and she invites him. He brings her <laughs> like a bouquet of lamb. It's kind of gross. Um, and she invites him over and we get this little shot. I love this because it's both part of the dance. She's taken the relationship a step further come over to my house, have a meal with me, you know, that's always a step. But also Popal's looking at her and it feels stalkery. It feels the vibe is borderline misogynistic creep. And so this is what I mean by these, these metaphors and themes are woven together. And this happens 
throughout the film. So you're never just existing in kind of, oh, this is the part of the film about PTSD. No, the PTSD is also about uh, man, both senses, <laughs> man's potential for savagery. And so they're constantly interwoven like this. And this is where a lot of the film's power comes from. I want to say a little bit about the cinematography and the editing because Rabier and Gaillard do fantastic work in this film. It's a real kind of joy to watch. The cinematography is, is wonderful. There's a series of lovely, very long, kind of intricate takes that are also very natural. They don't feel showy. They don't feel like you're in the middle of a highly choreographed long take. Some of them happen in nature. Um, some of them happen in town. The first one really is Popal and Elaine leave the wedding and it's done in one shot through the town. And it's lovely because it's, it's gentle and it's part of their dance. This is when we get the smoking line. And it doesn't call attention to itself, but it's quite dramatic in its length. Another really nice one occurs when Elaine takes the children mushroom hunting or mushroom gathering. And of course, Popal comes along for that too. He gathers the most mushrooms. But it's another lovely kind of tracking shot that doesn't call attention to it itself, except you're like, Where, where's the track? Is this, is this before the Steadicam? It's really well done and Rabier's work here is great. Even when the when it's not a tracking shot, the camera is moving. And what I like about this is it feels like the camera is probing, right? This is a mystery. And even if the film tells us early on, the killer's probably Popal, <laughs> it doesn't tell us definitively who the killer is until the kind of the climax. But the camera, it's, it's always moving around. Like it's looking for something, like it, it's probing. And it's very nicely done. It doesn't have a handheld jittery feel. It's a very gentle movement, but it happens throughout the film, but it's not constant because it's contrasted with a series of still shots and they work in different ways. Sometimes they bring a stillness to it, but often like still shots can do, they bring some tension. One of my favorite ones happens as we're getting closer to the climax and Elaine is worried for her safety and she lives in the schoolhouse in an apartment above the school and she's gone around and locked the doors and she's very nervous that the killer might be coming to get her and we get this shot of her going up to her apartment. I love how the stillness of the camera there in the stairwell and the use of light and shadows and sound, and the sound in this film is, is fantastic too, um, creates the tension. And, and the, the camera's been moving so much and that movement has been so dynamic that when it stops there at the foot of the stairs, part of you is like, wait, why? Why is this happening? <laughs> And it creates that tension. And then as she comes back down, you're like, what, what happened? And it's a very fantastic use of a still shot that the film makes use of throughout as well. So Rabier's cinematography here is part of the story and it's part of the story dynamic. It gives the film so much textual depth. Another shot I love is, is an example of what I'm calling a phantom POV shot. And I don't know if this is a true phantom POV shot. And what I mean by a phantom POV shot is a shot that's set up to look like a POV shot. And what is a POV shot? So you get these kind of standard medium shots or medium long shots, the American shot, which is kind of at eye level between the knees and the head with a little space above. And that's generally how we look at things um, in film in sort of standard coverage until we move into close-ups. Um, a POV shot might be from above looking down, right? Um, it's meant to indicate that a character, point of view, is watching a scene. A POV shot might have something sort of in between the camera and the subject to give the illusion that the character whose point of view we're in is, is hiding behind a bush or a wall or something like that that's obstructing their view. Um, a POV shot might move like this to give the feel of walking 
and, and so on. And so as you watch film, you get to recognize a POV shot, but they're almost always set up. So we have, you know, Cary Grant, look, he's behind a wall in North by Northwest. And then we cut to a shot from behind the wall looking into the house. Clearly, we've set up that this is Cary Grant's point of view. A phantom point of view is one that doesn't have any setup. So it has the kind of film grammar of a point of view shot, but with no sort of character context for whose point of view we might be sharing. And it, it creates a sort of disembodied, disquieting feeling. And this example of the school is a very good one. Now that may or may not be a phantom POV shot. We don't get any setup for it, but Popal's gonna show up later calling out to her. So maybe that was actually a Popal POV shot, but the film never establishes that clearly. So it has at least the element of a phantom shot and it creates this sense of she's being watched, she's being stalked. And perhaps when he shows up later, um, the existence of that phantom POV shot and then his arrival is meant to tie him more closely to our growing suspicion that, yeah, he's the killer. I mentioned Gaillard's editing and also the sound and, and they work together really well in this film. Um, the second victim is the school teacher's wife whose wedding we open the film with and she's the one that Elaine and the children fine after they emerge from the cave. And after her, her murder has been investigated, we get her funeral. And there's a, a really lovely cut and it's a sound cut as well, where we have the funeral bells chiming. And then the bells continue to chime as we cut to the scene back at the school, the school day is ending and we see Popal and he makes an illusion that he's doing some work on her flat, which we find out later he is. And the school teacher shows up and he's devastated because his wife has recently been, been murdered. And th th that sound bridge is great because the tolling bell and the tolling bell is going to occur with increasing frequency throughout the latter half of the film. And I just love the way it's used as a sound bridge in this edit from the funeral to the school. You know, the, the, the focus of the scene is Elaine and Popal, but really it's about the grief and probably again, the trauma that this school teacher has experienced because of the brutal murder of his wife. And the sound bridge and the edit there sets it up so well. Like, you know, ask not for whom the bell tolls, right? So what is, <laughs> what is the film about actually? And, and how, what is all of this stuff, the sort of thematic resonance, the metaphorical deployment, the, the film style, the cinematography and editing, what are they working towards? I've already kind of mentioned, it's a very simple story. We open on a wedding and Elaine, the, the headmistress of the school and Paul Paul, the kind of recently returned butcher, have been seated next to each other at the wedding. And we, we find out very early that he's a butcher. There's a lot of talk about meat and there's this joint of beef and he cuts it. And, and they become friendly. And there's a, there's a really nice flirtatiousness to their relationship. Elaine is young, she's beautiful. Audran's performance here is just one of like confidence and ease at the same time. She's just, it's no wonder Chabrol used her over and over again. She's just kind of natural in, in front of the camera, a lovely presence. And Yane is like, he plays very good. He plays someone uncomfortable in the world, but with enough kind of social skills and manners to mask that for a while. So, in the wedding scene and in the early scenes, he's also flirtatious, he's kind and gentle, and you only get senses of his nervousness, his uncomfortability in the world until he starts to talk later on about his experiences in war. And these two people who I've said earlier are kind of alone, but not necessarily lonely, fall together. And in a typical movie, these would be the early stages of a blossoming romance. And 
Popal seems to think that's what's happening. He brings her his bouquet of lamb and she invites him over. Um, but nothing further ever happens. Then she invites him on the mushroom trip with the children and in a break in foraging, they have this conversation where he asks her, why don't you have a lover? Um, and she tells this story. And I, I really like this because she seems quite comfortable and quite confident. She's not bemoaning her fate. She's wounded by whatever happened. She's saddened, but she seems okay and happy with her, what she has chosen as her lot in life. But Popal can't fathom this. It doesn't seem right to him. And then he's still pushing. And this for me is when he kind of turns a corner. It's subtle and it's not that creepy yet, especially if we put it in a 1970 context. But he asks her if he can kiss her. He implies that he'd like to kiss her. Her response again is one that's very assured, but also I think very knowing of gender roles and ge gender expectations in 1970 France. He's like, I won't kiss you. And she's like, you know, eh, please don't. You know, she's not gonna run to the guards. She's not gonna smack him. She's not gonna stop him because she knows how fraught that situation might be. But also she clearly expresses her wishes and one could say her lack of consent. Don't kiss me. And it's from here for me watching it that all of Popal's actions begin to become suspicious because he's been rebuffed informally up to this point. She hasn't asked him to stay over. She hasn't sort of welcomed him to her bed or anything like that or even kissed him. But now he's been rebuffed formally and he's going to tell her later that all I do is think of you and I want to be with you and all of this sort of stuff. But one of the great things about Yane's performance is that he embodies that desire, he embodies that obsession long before he ever tells her how he feels. One of the nice things about the film is that so much time and patience is dedicated to allowing this relationship to develop and to allowing Elaine's character to develop. And it's very important that she's a teacher, it's very important that she's single, that she's beautiful, that she's well liked, because what we begin to see is that she's very um, confident, but also very empathetic. When she's with her students and they're like, oh, this math problem's too hard. She's like, I don't care, do it. You have to do it because I know you can do it. And she's pushing her students to be better. She's stern with them because she cares about them. And so when we begin to question her decisions as things start to dawn on her, we're movie audiences. We're like, call the police. <laughs> but at the same time, we kind of understand. So the first big moment comes when she finds the body and next to the body is a lighter. And this is very important because during the mushrooming sequence, she and the students give Popal that lighter. It's his birthday. They give him the lighter and now she finds the lighter. This is a clue. <laughs> She's interrogated by the inspector and she doesn't mention this. She puts it in a drawer and she doesn't do anything about it. This is when, if you're an audience, you're like, tell the police. <laughs> but we also understand that part of what her mind is doing and part of the power of this film is that it has prepared us for this, that she's like, I don't want it to be him. He's my friend. This is also part of the power is that they are not lovers. Maybe she's still holding out a possibility for it, but she has not said that or committed to that. They are not lovers, but she cares about him. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, creepy, but believably creepy dynamic. And so she doesn't tell him the police about the lighter. She leaves the lighter there. And eventually Popal is going to find it through a series of events. And that's when he realizes she knows or she suspects. And from there, the thriller part of the film kicks in and that's when we get her running around 
locking the doors and so on because now she's come to believe he's the killer. And this all leads to the film's kind of climax and denouement, and I'm going to talk about it here. Um, spoilers, if you haven't seen the film and you want to watch it, sort of everything I've said so far is groundwork. Um, but if you don't want to know, turn this off now. It should be obvious to all the viewers by this point that Popal is the killer, and he is, and he eventually tricks her and gets into the building. And there's a turn of events or a series of turns here that are startling and really effective. The first is that he's holding the knife on her, telling her about his love, and it seems quite clear that he's going to kill her. And then we get this wonderful cut to black. And then as we cut back, we get this shock. Mademoiselle Hélène. Mademoiselle Hélène. Mademoiselle Hélène, aidez-moi. Qu'est-ce que vous avez fait Vous voyez bien, je me suis tué. Aidez-moi. This is a kind of a, a revelatory moment because it's weirdly like a moment of clarity on his part. And then soon after, she's working to take him to the hospital and he doesn't want to die. He's like, get me there. Hurry up. I don't want to die. Why did you kill yourself? To stop himself from killing her. That's the only explanation. He says he's compelled to kill these women. He's compelled. I have to do it. So he stabs himself instead. I don't in any way mean to justify his character by saying this is some sort of noble act or something or that, oh, he loved her so. No, he's crazy. He needs help. He needs therapy. But this is where Elaine's empathy kicks in because she knows that and she's probably known that all along. So as she rushes to get him to the hospital, I don't think She's trying to save Popal, the murderer, the creepy suitor. I think she's trying to save this man who's a person who needs saving. And this is where her kind of empathy kicks in. And then we get this long car ride that's really intense and disturbing where Popal talks about blood and all the blood that he's come across in his life and the smell of blood. And as a butcher, his having seen so much animal blood and smelled it. And as a soldier, his having seen so much human blood and smelled it. And how he feels his own blood and now smells his own blood. And it's very disturbing. And it ties into his post-traumatic stress is that he is damaged. He is traumatized, deeply, deeply traumatized. And probably for other things too. He describes his father as probably abusive. He describes his school teacher as probably abusive, whatever that is. But certainly his experience in war has, has destroyed his psyche. And now as he bleeds out in her car, he's kind of coming to an, a moment of enlightenment. And it's, it's twisted and it's weird and it's beautifully rendered because as she listens, she kind of understands him. <laughs> And then we get this moment in the hospital and I, I find this like disturbing and beautiful at the same time. Earlier in the forest where it's beautiful and they've spent this day picking mushrooms and he's like, what would you do if I kissed you? She's like, don't. And now he's like, I'm a bloody murderer who's obsessed with blood and hates women, but I kind of love you. Will you kiss me? And she's like, okay. <laughs> wow. And this is what the film, the themes, the, the, the camera movements, the camera angles, the editing decisions, the performances, particularly Odron's performances, have all led to this moment where it's twisted 
and it's disturbed and it's a hundred percent believable. And this is the kind of the power of the film is that once we get there with her and we're still audience is going, oh, don't kiss him, don't kiss him. The meaning of that kiss is something that the film asks us to sit with, to try to understand why she would go there. And that I think is a very powerful part of this film that it takes this good person and it doesn't turn her evil. It relies on her empathic abilities to put her in a place where she can hope for or empathize with or want to help a murderer. And that's a tricky place to get to. And that is what this film asks us to understand. It's a fantastic film. It's beautifully made, shot, directed, performed, edited. The, the score is really good. This lovely ominous score by Jansen that I didn't talk to, uh, that I didn't talk about too much, but it's, it's a fantastic score. Um, and, and it's, it's just, so meticulously made to lead us up to these fin final moments that you don't always know that that's where it's going. And once you get there, you just kind of like, whoa. And that effect is marvelous and that, that it's a great film. That's all for now. Thanks for watching everybody. If you've made it this far, what are you doing? Like the video, subscribe to my channel, hop on over to my Patreon and check out the other content that I'm putting up over there. Share this video with your friends. Come back for more. I've got a few more videos in the French Spring series that I'm hoping to get to, including another break the scene of one of my favorite weird little scenes in a French New Wave film. We'll be getting into the 70s and 80s with what makes this film great. And then watch the community page because I'll have a poll up for what kind of series I should do after I wrap up the French Spring. Thanks everybody. This is Movie Talk with Aaron Hunter. I'm Aaron Hunter. Keep watching movies.